This is FOA YouTube lecture number 37. In this lecture, we're talking about fiber to the antenna, or how fiber optics is being used to connect wireless cellular towers into the phone network and to even connect the antennas on the towers to the base stations at the ground. The increased demand for cellular bandwidth to support fast-growing data usage from smartphones and tablets requires upgrading cellular towers. More bandwidth means more bandwidth to the towers and more antennas on the towers. Today's cell towers are being modified to replace older coax cables to the antennas with fiber optic cables, which reduces weight and cost. The diagram shows what a current cell tower looks like. The diagram is way too complicated for a quick view, so we'll focus on various areas of the tower to show how fiber is used. Then we'll go into issues of installation and testing. On a cell tower, the cellular antennas connect the user's mobile devices. But those communication signals must connect into the public telephone networks. Older towers connected on copper wires, just like many older landline subscribers. However, those copper wires do not have adequate bandwidth for modern mobile devices. So those towers are being changed over to connect into the phone system on fiber optics. An exception to that is towers in remote locations where microwave relay systems may still be used. But those towers, while they don't have the same bandwidth, are typically not serving as many users as towers in metropolitan and suburban areas. Traditional cell towers use copper coax cables. The network feed goes into a base transceiver unit, which drives analog signals up the tower over a coax cable to a masthead amplifier, which is connected by a short coax cable to a passive antenna. The coax has very high attenuation, so the final amplifier is needed to provide adequate signal to drive the antenna. Today's towers are moving to a digital fiber optic system to a remote radio unit at the top of the tower that converts the digital signal to analog and drives the passive antenna over copper coax cable. The cables up the tower have fiber for the signal and electrical conductors to power the remote radio unit, usually inside an armored protective jacketing. The baseband unit on the ground connects to the network, either by fiber optic cables or sometimes microwave antennas. The expectation is that in the future, and the near future at that, the antenna will become an active device, with a remote radio unit integrated into the antennas. Some towers are already being fitted with antennas like this, with an active antenna, one only needs a fiber copper cable to bring digital signals directly to the antenna and power for the radio unit inside the antenna. On most systems today, the single cable has both fiber and power carried up the tower. It's terminated in a distribution box that breaks out the fiber, the signal, to the remote radio unit and power separately. The remote radio unit then has a coax cable that goes directly to the antenna. Here's an example of some actual hardware installed in a teaching lab. To the left is a distribution box that terminates the fiber and copper conductors 
and breaks out into two separate power and signal cables to the remote radio unit, RRU, that drives the antenna over a coaxial cable. The distribution box has two sections, a fiber section and a power section. The fiber section has a patch panel to connect the cable coming up the tower to the patch cords taking signal to each of the remote radio units. The copper section has copper connections for power to each of the RRUs and lightning surge protection, which is necessary uh, to have on the top of the tower. The lower distribution box also handles both fiber and copper connections, but it's bigger to allow storage for excess fiber optic cable in case the prefab cable is too long. If the cable is too long, the armored jacket can be stripped off and the excess fiber stored in this box. The copper conductors are cut to length. The box also has provision for grounding and bonding the cables, including the corrugated metal armor on the cable. Typical fiber to the antenna cable has both fiber and copper conductors in one cable, often covered with an armor, metallic armor, under the jacket. The fibers may be either single mode or multi mode, depending on the radio system used. Connectors are usually duplex LC types for their small size. Cables are usually prefab assemblies, terminated in a factory to the proper length and shipped on large spools like this one for safe transport. The main issues with these cables are to make certain the cables are protected and not damaged during installation. Here you can see the individual fiber optic cables and copper conductors exiting the cable's armored jacket. The individual fiber optic connectors should be handled carefully to prevent damage or contamination from dirt. Keep those protective caps on the connectors. Some cables that plug directly into equipment may use connectors inside a ruggedized sealed housing, as you can see in the small photo in the center of the slide. Installation issues are straightforward. You have to be careful installing the heavy cable as you lift it up the tower and lash it in place. You have to protect the fiber optic connectors. You have to clean them carefully and test them. And you have to make the copper connections inside the distribution boxes. Here is a cable being held by a Kellum's grip and lifted to the top of the tower with a winch, complete with a bucket full of accessories to use for its installation. Like any other prefab fiber optic cable, it should not be installed until it has been tested to assure yourself the cable is okay. This means cleaning and inspecting the connectors and doing an insertion loss test for the cable on the ground before installation. Recording this data is very important because it can be used to compare to the results of the tests of the cable after it's installed to ensure it has not been damaged. Cellular antennas are often installed on buildings as well as on towers. Rooftop installation require permission from the building owner and the designer will work with the owner of the building on the location of antennas, as well as where the remote radio units and baseband units will get installed. One also has to decide where to route cables within the building and whether to install cable trays or conduit for the cables on the roof to keep them organized and protect them. It's hard to generalize about rooftop installations. 
as it depends on the building structure and design. Most systems will have the baseband unit somewhere downstairs in the building connecting to the phone network and the remote radio units and antennas on the roof. Some buildings may mount the antennas on the building. Some may have towers on the roof built just for the antennas. Cables run in the buildings will probably have conduits and cable trays will often be installed for managing all the necessary cables on the roof. All of these issues have to be negotiated with the building owners and managers. After installation, you repeat the insertion loss test done on the cable while still on the spool. You can also use a visual fault locator, which allows you to determine the polarity of the cables, tracing cables out to make sure you have the right cables. Some users call for OTDR testing, but it requires special high resolution OTDRs that are necessary and even then some interpretation of the data. Of course, before every test or connection, clean the connectors. The dry cleaning tools, like this one, are the easiest to use. Insertion loss testing uses a source and power meter to test the cable and the way it will be used by the communications equipment. However, it's very inconvenient for a tech to have either a source or a meter at the top of the tower, plugging it into the cable. A simple way to solve this problem is to use a loopback, a simple duplex connector with a length of fiber that plugs into the cable at the top and allows you to test both the fiber going up the tower and the fiber coming down the tower with a meter and source at the bottom of the tower. You can use the same loopback idea for testing with an OTDR. You need a high resolution OTDR and the loopback needs to have enough fiber in it so that both ends can be distinguished well by the OTDR to allow making reasonable measurements on the cable. More details on how to test these cables is on the FOA page about fiber to the antennas on the FOA online guide. We recommend you go to that page to get all of the details on testing. Fiber to the antenna installation involves work that is dangerous and for which crews need specialized training and certification plus specialized equipment made for the job. The crew should have OSHA training and certification for this kind of work and they should have the correct personal safety equipment that protects them while they're climbing the towers. For more information on fiber to the antenna, you can go to the FOA online guide and find fiber to the antenna under applications in the table of contents or use the Google search engine to search our website for FTTA for fiber to the antenna. We're the Fiber Optic Association, the professional society of fiber optics. We offer certification for specialists in fiber to the antenna as well as other applications and skills appropriate to fiber optic installation.